Order members, it's now time for questions to the Minister of Health, Social Services and Public Safety, and I call Alvin McGuinness. Uh, thank you, Deputy Speaker. Uh, number one. Uh, Mr Deputy Speaker, uh, Transforming Your Care recommended that homes should be the hub for care for older people. This is in keeping with my department's policy direction in helping people in, to live independently with the support of flexible, responsive and person-centred social care in their own homes and communities for as long as it is safe to do so. As part of this allocation of resources, including staff time, is based on comprehensive assessment of the individual need of the relevant Health and Social Care Trust. The actual length of time allocated for any one domiciliary care visit is a result of this individualised and professional assessment of need. Of course, trusts have an underpinning responsibility to use the, resor have an underpinning responsibility to use the resources fairly and wisely and are responsible for assessing and prioritising needs within the resources available to them. I call Alden McGuinness. Thank you very much, uh, Deputy Speaker. And could I just take this opportunity of congratulating the Minister on his appointment? I don't think I've had an opportunity of doing that. Or maybe commiserations on your appointment. Uh, but uh, we, have, we, we have heard quite a lot about uh, transforming your care, uh, uh, Mr. Deputy Speaker. Uh, but in situations where staff uh, are affected, uh, frontline staff are affected, and there may well be redeployment as a result of that. Could the minister reassure staff that, in the event of that, that redundancy packages would be made available to those staff uh, who are being redeployed? Um, could I uh, assure the honourable member for North Belfast that the contingency plans, which were the subject of the previous debate, have made it very clear there will be no compulsory redundancies. Staff will be moved to adjacent facilities. So therefore, it may be for some of those individuals uh, that may not be possible, and we'll certainly look at the, the potential for, for the standard redundancies. I think it's also worth saying that at the moment we provide 249,000 hours of domiciliary care in Northern Ireland to 25,330 people, and that is a 5% increase on the same period in 2012. So therefore, I think that gives an indication of my department's commitment to this essential uh, type of care, that far from, as you believe in certain media, that there's been a cut in this, we're actually increasing the resources to this very important frontline care and hope to continue to do so. And I think that's also been emphasised by the fact that in the budget, monitoring round bid of October, uh, we, for October, we actually bid and fortunately received an extra £8 million. Pounds uh, which has been allocated to transform your care implementation for 1415, and that will support a wide range of measures, including how we enhance provision for the elderly closer to home. I call uh, Paula Bradley. Uh, thank you, Mr. Deputy Speaker, and can I thank the Minister for his answers thus far? And I think everyone would agree in the Chamber that the principles of transforming your care and the, the fact that people are better served in their own home than being in an, in an acute setting is certainly something we can all agree with. But can I ask the Minister if he could detail um, the domiciliary care provision across all of Northern Ireland? Yes, I, 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 I can. Uh, Belfast, we provide 47,000 hours, Northern 48,000, the South Eastern Trust 58,000, the Southern 53,000, and the Western 42,000, a total of 249,000 hours of care. So, as the member for North Belfast will see, it spread relatively uh, evenly across the entire province and is based entirely on the clinical assessment made by each individual trust. And that's a, a total of 25,330 people who benefit from this care. And I know from the feedback that I receive within the department that in the vast majority of those cases, uh, the individual recipient of that care is extremely happy with the dedication of the staff concerned and really appreciate this service which enables, enables them to stay in their own home within their communities. I call Rosalie McCorley. Um, thank you, Mr. Deputy Speaker, and I thank the Minister for his answers um, up to now. Um, can I ask the Minister uh, what uh, way are domiciliary care workers protected and supported in circumstances where they sometimes find themselves vulnerable, sometimes maybe, uh, as has happened, being accused of theft? 
without any uh, real bad intention, but sometimes when we're dealing with clients with dementia and older people, um, what, what way are staff in those circumstances supported? Um, first of all, can I say that the vast majority of the staff in this field are dedicated, honest, professional, and making an excellent contribution to provision in Northern Ireland. Unfortunately, and very occasionally, and we've all seen these reported in the media, occasionally one or two individuals breach the fundamental trust uh, that, they, that they should hold within the community. And when that happens, unfortunately, uh, uh, they will have to be brought to book in a normal legal way, and indeed there have been prosecutions. They have also got uh, strong representation from the unions who will give those who are accused wrongly the protection and support they deserve. But I don't want these one or two incidents to overshadow the tremendous work that we, do, we get, the tremendous work that they do, both in the statutory sector and, of course, growing and more a growing trend, the large number who are employed by private contractors who provide this service. In some trusts, it's a two to one ratio between private and public. So, therefore, I think the normal rigour of the law has to apply, but with strong safeguards through, through the unions to ensure that those who are wrongly accused are given the full possible uh, benefit of a strong defence. Dobson. Mr Deputy Speaker, will the Minister accept that decisions coming out of the Trust do significantly scale back domiciliary care packages, inclu uh, in, including reducing the number of visits? flies in the face of a supposed policy of giving older people more choice, more control over their care, as well as enabling as many as possible to remain in their homes? Does he not accept the current proposals Question, will please. simply see more people seek residential care? Well, I hope I've shown the, the member for Upper Ban earlier that, in fact, the Trusts have a very strong commitment to actually increasing uh, the number of hours, and I've shown that there are, has been a 5 per cent increase since 2012, and that we have, uh, we have actually uh, additional resources secured in the monitoring realm. And a review of domiciliary care across Northern Ireland has been initiated by the Health and Social Care Board as part of TYC. The aim of this review is to obtain a better understanding of how domiciliary care is currently operating and identify best practice within the various models of delivery in order to shape the future direction and operation of domiciliary care services. On her earlier point, I have to emphasise that the, de the decision as to the number of hours allocated to each uh, client is based on the clinical assessment of the trusts as to the needs of that person. If they assess that the need is 15 minutes a day, it's 15 minutes. If it's half an hour, if it's multiple visits, that's entirely a decision of the relevant staff within each trust. It's not based on budgets. It's not based on bookkeeping. It's based on need. And I think the stats would show, and the overall quantum would indicate, that there's a very strong commitment to that by all the trusts in Northern Ireland. I call Robin Swan. Question number two. Um, in my statement of the 30th of October 2014, I said that my priorities are to ensure the services provided by the health and social care sector are safe and effective and to ensure that all my, de all my department achieves financial balance, as is required of all ministers. To achieve these aims, Health and Social Care Trusts have produced a range of contingency proposals, and indeed we were debating these earlier. Each trust has provided me with an assurance that the services will their services will remain safe and effective. As part of its contingency plans, the Northern Trust has proposed a temporary closure of respite beds in the Dalriada Hospital for sufferers of multiple sclerosis. I regret that the Trust has had to take this action as a consequence of budget pressures. However, it will simply not be possible to maintain the current level of service provision in the absence of the entire funding required of an extra £130 million. The Northern Trust has affirmed that it will endeavour to minimise the impact on frontline patient care. Respite services to MS patients will still be provided, and everybody who requires respite will receive it. The Trust will be working with everyone involved to ensure that all service users' needs are central to the process moving forward. Furthermore, the Trust has also provided an assurance that anyone who has been booked into respite uh, care in November 
will have no change in that booking. My department will monitor the situation closely over the incoming months to ensure that the service provided to MS sufferers in the Northern Trust continues to meet the needs of the local population. I call Robin Swan. Mr Deputy Speaker acknowledges the Minister's answer. It's unfortunate he didn't actually answer the question that was originally put to him. And in the supplementary, I will ask whether he will intervene to reverse the decision of, to remove multiple sclerosis respite services provided at Dalriada Hospital. That was the question, not about trust or the provision provided elsewhere. If the Minister would do us the decency and answer that section of the question. I thank the Honourable Member for his supplementary. And I must say, when I was a backbencher, I found it very annoying when the Minister didn't answer the question. So if I'm guilty of that, then uh, he's, you're absolutely right to point that out. But I think he, as a member for North Antrim, who's been lobbying on this issue, has to face up to some very difficult statistics. In the year 2013-14, the total number of bed days available at the Dalriada was 4,380. Of these, only 1,402 were actually used. Now, that equates to a bed occupancy of 32%, or an average of four beds occupied at any given time. That is a very stark statistic, that we are funding a lot of empty capacity there. Secondly, there are 4,000 MS sufferers in Northern Ireland, and I am acutely aware of the difficulty of this long-term condition. But only 57 of those 4,000 actually used the Dalriada respite care. 50, uh, of those, sorry, sorry, 57 sorry, from the Northern Trust, 2 from the Belfast Trust, and 10 from the Western Trust, trust sorry, a total of 69. 69 sufferers out of 4,000 used Dalriada. So therefore, the trend was unfortunately quite negative in terms of usage of this. Now, I accept, and I have been contacted by many of those 69, tell me about the excellent care they've received in Ballycast, and I accept that. But I am surprised, given the large numbers of potential users of that, that uh, excellent facility, that so far, so few have availed of it. I call Paul Free. Thank you, uh, Mr. Deputy Speaker. Can I take this opportunity now to thank uh, the Minister uh, for agreeing to meet with some of the protesters here uh, uh, for the Dalriada Hospital here today at my request? And this is uh, can I ask, the, can I ask the, the, the Minister that when he states that there has been 1, 000, or 1,402 uh, beds used, uh, does he take note that the Trust seems to care more about the empty bed than the patient within the bed? And what engagement has the Trust had? with the people, the service users and their families, and how can he assure that the Trust will keep that engagement up throughout these weeks, days, weeks and months? Um, could, I, could I assure the Honourable Member for North Antrim that I have carried out a, lar a large amount of my time over this last few weeks have been with this specific issue. I met a deputation led by the MP for the area. I have discussed it regularly with himself. I met a deputation led by Mr Mackay uh, about, about the issue. I am also receiving a petition today from those who um, are very exercised about this in Ballycastle. I have received literally thousands of emails, text messages, Twitter messages, correspondence and phone calls about this. I am also pledging myself to meet with the District Council Chair and a delegation from Moyle District Council. So there will be a considerable amount of consultation about this issue. And I will want to hear from all of those concerned. And of course, I also met Patricia Gordon and Brenda Maguire, who are officials from the MS Society of Northern Ireland. So, therefore, I am not taking this decision lightly. I want to hear from service users. And could I send a personal note? I know personally three of the patients in that hospital. And they have all been on to me personally to indicate their perception of the care they're receiving. So therefore, I am not going into this decision blind whatsoever. I am taking it very, very seriously. Uh, and also, I have met the Trust to discuss it as well. Before I call the next speaker, could I encourage uh, members and the Minister to ensure that they speak into the microphone in order that what they are saying is picked up? I call Daki Mackay. I get the uh, last comment clear. Uh, it is quite clear, Minister, that over the past couple of weeks, the steps by the Northern Trust to run down the hospital uh, have accelerated quite significantly. Uh, and my concern is that you haven't made a decision yet and we don't know when you're going to make a decision. So rather than allow the Trust to continue to do that for another two weeks, can you let the House know when you will make a decision in regard to Dalriada? As I said to the, the member for North Antrim, I have still yet to meet the District Council on this and I think they have a very important democratic input. 
I also, I intend to visit the service at some stage to see for myself. Now, I know Ballycastle extremely well for reasons which will remain uh, not spoken about today, but I've been in Ballycastle many, many times in any, any given year. Uh, equally, um, there are still some issues uh, on the finances of this because the, the, the total closure, uh, the temporary closure, is at uh, 0.6 million pounds. So it is a very, very significant amount of money that we saved. And what I would be interested in, from all the members from that constituency, and also perhaps to some extent from East Antrim, because also met Mr. Oliver McMullen as well about this issue uh, to, to discuss it, is can they come up with an alternative to this decision? which would be more acceptable to their community. Because in all of the debate that's been held before, and all the questions about this, everyone's decrying the fact that the Northern Trust has come up with this decision. But nobody has suggested any alternative to it. And at the end of the day, I have to ensure that the Trust balance their books by the 31st of March. I have no option whatsoever in taking a debt forward into 1516. So I have to ensure that I land this large spaceship called public health spending on a postage stamp called balanced budget. Now, is anybody going to give me any help on that? I suspect not. I call Jim Allister. Is it the case that in this very year, correspondence issued assuring the future of Dalriada? And if that is correct, did that not create a legitimate expectation which the minister should feel honour-bound uh, to live up to? And will he I think the members live asked up to that question. commitment and postpone and abandon this closure of Dalriada? Um, the letter the member refers to is actually uh, was not signed by myself, it was signed by my predecessor. Um, I am looking carefully at the contents of that letter because I think it is relevant. But it is worth saying that my understanding of the wording of it, it said there was no plans to curtail future services uh, provided at the Del Riada. But I expect that he has a, a learned counsel in these issues, and he may believe that there was a future expectation. My advice I'm getting is that it didn't, but it is germane to this argument about the future of Del Riada. I accept that. Moving on, I call Alistair MacDonald. Thank you very much, Mr. Deputy Speaker. Question number three, please. Um, <clears throat> my priorities are to ensure the services provided by the health and social care by health and social care are safe and effective, and to ensure that my department achieves financial balance as is required by all ministers. I have allocated an additional five million of additional funding to address winter pressures in delivering on scheduled care. This money will be used to improve patient flow from emergency departments and expand capacities required over the winter period. Significant progress has been made in tackling lengthy waiting lists in EDs. The first six months of 1415 have seen the lowest number of 12-hour waits in five years. I am looking to the Health and Social Care Board and trust to improve on this in the incoming winter. I call Alistair MacDonald. Thank you very much, Mr Deputy Speaker, and could I thank the Minister. Minister, there is a deep concern out there, that, and I refer you to the previous question where there was a discussion uh, around Dalriada and the concerns there, but there's a deep concern in that context that decisions taken by one trust will have a knock-on effect on other, on other trusts next door. And then while on the surface of it, of it, it might appear that, uh, that uh, money on paper could be saved, in fact, there will be a cost will just be pushed sideways. Can you give us some assurance and perhaps give us some evidence that this, that will not happen. Well, can I say that I hope that the extra £5 million that has been allocated will ensure that that won't happen. That is additional new, fresh resources to that particular field. I, I listened with interest this morning Mr McKinney's radio interview on this very subject. I think it somewhat spoiled my breakfast, but it was interesting to hear uh, what he was saying about this. Um, I think the number of instances where that could actually happen are quite rare. For instance, in the Western Trust, it's very hard to see how uh, services could spill over, for instance, into the Northern Trust, given the distances involved. But it may be, it may be a Belfast issue uh, that it may arise. And each health and social care trust has provided assurances that their services will remain safe and effective. 
and have taken steps to support and protect frontline services. For instance, and, and again Mr McKinney raised this, where minor injury units are temporarily closed, temporarily closed, provision is to be put into place in the large emergency departments and discussions held with GPs and GP out of our services to, ma to maintain effective flows for minor injuries. Appropriate alternative arrangements must be made in the case of ward or bed closures. Any restrictions in domiciliary care must be supported by individual needs assessment and risk assessment. I call Pam Cameron. Thank you, Deputy Speaker, and I thank the Minister for the, his answers um, so far. Uh, and we don't under, I'm sure nobody in this chamber underestimates um, the difficulties that the Minister is under at this present time. Can I ask the Minister if he'll provide a breakdown of the extra £5 uh, million pounds being directed to unscheduled care? Well, to date, £2.3 million of this has been allocated to the Trust, including the Northern Ireland Ambulance Service. The funding has been provided to, pro to provide additional consultants, pharmacy staff, as well as a hospital ambulance liaison officers in the Royal, Ulster, Antrim and Craigavon hospitals. And it's also been used to introduce new models of working and fund external support specialists to improve healthcare systems and hospital performance. The remaining 2.7 million will be allocated to, to the Trust to fund measures to improve patient flow and expand capacity over the winter months. The Board have asked Trust to submit proposals. It is expected 600,000 will be used to enhance out of hours capacity in primary and community care, 400,000 for each of the five Trusts and 100,000 to the Northern Ireland Ambulance Service. A further 750,000 will be provided from Board baseline funds. Call Kieran McCarthy. Mr. Deputy Speaker, does the Minister concur with the commitment given by his APS, Mr. Easton, that the money will be found to keep the minor's injuries open in Bangor? And how exactly will that be done? I think the message uh, uh, that I would portray, uh, uh, outline to, Mr. to my very valuable APS and to, to others is that if alternatives can be found, the South East Trust. The South East Trust Order. have give a com given a commitment that they will look seriously at them. And here we are, well into this particular question time, and not a single MLA of any description has suggested to me other ways which they believe are a more efficient way of delivering a balanced budget Order. and cause less pain to their community. So it's one thing saying I totally uh, denounce all of the proposals made to make the books balance, but not make one suggestion of anything that can be done to balance the books by the 31st of March 2015. Order and if Mr Easton or anybody else comes up with, with alternative proposals, I will be delighted to see them, delighted to see them and look very sympathetically upon them. Question, question numbers 4 and 11 have been withdrawn. I call John Dallet. Order. Question number four and eleven have been withdrawn. I call John Dallet. Question number five. My officials have been liaising with the Health and Social Care Board, the Public Health Agency, and the five trusts over the past number of months to identify all available savings, uh, opportunities that could be used to deliver, the, in the, in, to deliver a balanced budget in the last four and a half months of the financial year but also ensuring that patient safety would not be compromised by such proposals. I very much regret, and I mean that, very much regret, that such measures are necessary, but the challenges facing my department are significant, and the 80 million additional funding provided by the executive in the June and October monitoring rounds did not address all of these identified pressures. This means that the trusts have been required to develop and implement a range of contingency plans to ensure financial break-even, an obligation which is required of all the ministers around the executive table. I call John Dallet for supplementary. Speaker, the minister will know that my constituency straddles two health trust areas, and he will also know that last week the health trust and the Western Board had the courage to say they got it wrong in OMA. Will the minister now ensure that the Northern Health Trust has the decency to say they got it wrong in Ballycastle? And will the Minister live up to his own colleague David McElveen, who addressed the meeting in Cushendall last week, and do the honourable thing? Tell them to say sorry and change their minds. Well, 
The member for East London Derry knows that there's going to be a major assembly debate on this issue. I think it's scheduled in for the 27th of November. And I will be listening with great interest to all of the considered views of all the MLAs affected by the Dal Riada decision. And I would hope by then that they will have come up with alternative suggestions to me, which means that all of us can avoid this very, very difficult decision. So therefore, I, that is like where this issue is best considered. After I have consulted widely with so many of the groups involved in this, my door is open to people who want to speak to me about this decision and has, has been open. Regarding the Western Trust decision, I do accept what he says, that the Chief Executive announced last week that they were going to suspend their decision on the palliative care beds in OMA. But, but, and there's a very significant but, she realises, as does her board, that they're going to have to come back with an alternative suggestion which will make exactly the same level of savings. So it's not a question of saying this is unpalatable, therefore we're not going to come up with the money. They're going to have to make their books balance in the same way that the Northern, South Eastern, Belfast, Trust, etc. are going to have to make their books balance. And can I tell you that they're all finding this extremely painful? I call Maeve McLaughlin. Uh, thank the Minister. But would the Minister not accept that uh, the, 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 the scandalous uh, amount paid out to senior consultants for bonuses would, would go a long way to, uh, to save Dalriada and many, many other frontline services? And, and could I say to the, the member for Londonderry, I have an awful lot of sympathy for what she's saying. I think in these very, very difficult financial times that we're in, I find it almost impossible to justify consultants bonuses or enhanced payments or whatever they are. There is a difficulty in terms that they may be a con contractual obligation that we might have huge problems getting out of. I would say they'd far rather have a shield from the minister rather than a mere 20 or 30,000 pound bonus. Chance would be a fine thing, but it is an important point. So many people are getting them. They're costing us a lot of money, and I think they're anachronism. I think they're a child of their time when we had to pay the bonuses to retrain and re attract frontline consultants who at that time were moving down into the Irish Republic, etc., where there was big payments to be made. So we are looking at that. But also, could I remind her that we spend £1.5 million a year as a department funding full-time union officials. We pay the vast majority of union officials that are employed in the health trust are paid directly and entirely by this department. And I have to say, if we're going to look at consultants' bonuses, we need to look at that issue as well, because one and a half million pounds would effectively mean we wouldn't have to take any decision on Ballycastle or on Bangor. I call Michael McGimsey. Uh, thank you, Deputy Speaker. And can I ask the Minister, uh, and can I say I understand exactly where he stands, uh, the decision uh, to come forward with the proposals at Bangor and Del Riyadh and Craig Avenue and so on, what efforts did the Trust make to make you aware as Minister that they were going, coming forward with these decisions? And uh, have you asked them for their alternatives? Because since they are the ones who are delivering the service, they will have a range of alternatives, or did they simply plump for the ones that are now in the public domain? First, first of all, could I thank him personally for the responsible stance that he's taken as an MLA on the committee to the problems that the health service are facing? There would have been a golden opportunity to have wreaked revenge on myself. And I thank him for the fact that in the interim few months he has been, and my, <laughs> maybe time yet, but he has been very responsible. And this is a very responsible question. Could I say that yes, indeed, there are other options out there. But I would guarantee that some of them that I'm aware of, that should I decide to implement them, there will be another delegation from another part of the trust area, laid often by the same MLA as it came to me about the first set of decisions, protesting about that. So therefore, we simply move the problem down the road, as it were, because none of these changes in actual physical services are popular. But I would like to work with individual MLAs because they all tell me how bright and able they are. They all tell me how much they know about the health service, which I don't. So if they've got their ear to the ground and know better, come and speak to me because I think nobody would be happier if they could come up with a solution to the budget problem that keeps everybody happy and means that we end the end of the year without going into deficit. And that is the end of our period for list questions. So we now move on to topical questions. And I call Fra McCann. Well, 
Mr. Last Count Collier, uh, thank you very much, um, Mr. Deputy Speaker. Can the Minister provide us with an explanation on the recent Freedom of Information published on conferences and training at the Health and Social Care Boards? Conferences. Yes, and I've read the press reports, the recent press reports about that issue. And we have asked, and indeed the Trust and the Board are implementing restrictions on conferences and travel. And indeed, um, I notice uh, a much smaller number of officials from the Trust and the Board at conferences that I attend as Minister. We have also asked for a 2.5% reduction in administration costs uh, to be taken out of Trust and the Board. Uh, and I think that's an indication that we do want to see that issue looked at. But I think it's one that the public find difficult to understand. But equally, you, we need to be very careful because we have some top performing uh, staff in the health service. And it's important, I think, that they do at times travel to hear of best practice and to learn from new techniques so, uh, and new types of service. We have to learn from the rest of the world because we in Northern Ireland don't have all of the answers. But in the incoming very difficult financial conditions, and members, if you think that this year is bad, then wait to 2015-16, where we have even tougher decisions to take. And one of them may be that we're going to have to greatly restrict travel, conferences, and expenses of all of those involved uh, throughout the health and social care system to balance the books. A call from a can for supplementary. I, I thank the minister uh, for his answer, and I, I do appreciate and understand that there, there are occasions and times uh, when, when these conferences may be essential and prove worthwhile. But could you give us a, a, a figure of the total cost of the conference uh, to date? Um, the, the, well, certainly it's a lot less than the penalty that my department is taking because of the failure to agree on welfare reform. Yeah. An awful lot less. And whilst these issues may be high in the public uh, interest, particularly in the Irish news, I think it's also important to realise that even if we solve them overnight, it is a mere drop in the ocean compared to the 87 million hit that we're taking as a community because of the failure of members opposite to agree welfare for reform. Yeah, yeah. And my department's cut of that would normally be 32 million. If I had the 32 million, the last two hours would have been much more pleasant for me and members. But yes, I still accept, I have made the political point, but I still accept that it's absolutely vital, absolutely vital that we look at this issue and make certain we're getting good value for money. Order, and order. I, will, I will write to him. I will ask departmental officials for this information. I will write to him and give him as much detail as I can. Moving on, I call Michaela Boyle. Minister, Western Health Trust managers arrived at work on Thursday past to an announcement that the Ash Ward within the Tyrone and Fermanagh Hospital Anoma, which caters for people with dementia and challenging behaviours, is to be closed at the end of the month. Mm -hmm. are, are the Trust acting alone on this, Minister, or were you made aware of this? I have to say to the Honourable Lady, no, I wasn't aware of it. I'll be absolutely truthful with her. Um, I uh, am waiting for a briefing on that. Um, that, I don't believe, is part of the contingency plans that were outlined to me by the five trusts. Uh, unless it's a knock-on from the, um, the OMA situation, I'm not aware. But I, I will investigate this immediately, and I'll come back to her. Uh, and equally, if she has uh, concerns about this, I'm more than happy to meet with her and service users to see what the significance of this particular decision is. I try to keep my uh, eye on all of what's happening in Northern Ireland in terms of potential closures and changes of service, but I have to say this one has passed me by. I call Michaela Boyle for supplementary. Uh, can I thank the Minister for indeed for his honesty? And um, will the Department will work now with the Trust, as you outlined, um, to ensure that staff that potentially will be affected at the Tyrone and Fermanagh Hospital will be retained. And as the Minister did outline, this is a major concern. It is a concern that has arisen since Thursday of last. Just Gormogut. Uh, could, could I say, in all of these decisions, all staff who wish to remain within the Western Trust will do so. There was a prediction when Mr. Pritz took over as the health minister, there were 4,000 compulsory redundancies in the health service. That simply hasn't happened. No one who wishes to stay has, has been sacked or moved on in any shape or form. Certainly, uh, the Western Trust, I know, will make a similar commitment to Ash House. Those staff clearly can be used elsewhere. They're experienced, uh, and there's plenty of opportunities in other parts of the Western Trust 
within reason, of course, given uh, travel to work times and, and distances. So I will investigate that. And I, I will be asking the question why um, the first I heard of it when, when she raised it there a few, few minutes ago, I would, be, I would have been keen to be notified about that decision. I call Alden McGuinness. Thank you very much, uh, Deputy Speaker. Uh, there is a proposal um, by the Northern Trust, I understand, in relation to the White Abbey Minor Injuries Unit um, to suspend its operations. Now, given that uh, that takes in really the uh, part of Greater North Belfast, what effect will that have and what provision has been made by the Trust in relation to the pressures that inevitably will adversely impact on the matter A&E? Uh, that not only applies to White Abbey, it also applies to Armagh and it applies to, applies to Bangor. So there are three minor injuries units which are going to be temporarily um, closed until the end of the financial year. And could be absolutely honest with members today and say that some of these proposals may eventually become the subject of consultation for permanent closure. I have to be honest and straight and say I'm not going to try and say here this afternoon that all of what's been proposed is indeed a temporary arrangement. But what we have discovered from previous changes to minor injuries is that you don't get a commensurate rise in demand in adjacent units. Some people decide to wait and go to their GP. Some decide to go to their GP out of hours. Uh, and some simply don't go anywhere. So therefore, I am confident that either the, the matter or, of course, the royal could uh, take any of the additional stress covered by this decision. And of course, the staff still remain in position. So therefore, it may be we're able to transfer staff from some of these men and injured units to, the, to an, an adjacent hospital so that there's extra trained individuals available to treat what ex, whatever extra number of people come through the door. Uh, and also reminding him that we still have added the uh, five million extra which will be invested in EDs uh, throughout Northern Ireland, which will assist. So we'll be watching that situation very clearly. And again, I've had representations from, from MLAs about the White Abbey decision. But White Abbey does enjoy the benefit of being relatively uh, close to Belfast provision, unlike some of the rural situations where it can be 20 or 30 miles to the nearest minor injuries unit. I call Old McGuinness for supplementary. Uh, I, I thank the Minister for his candour in relation to the issue that I raised with him. Uh, but really, you know, it, uh, part of the problem here is the failure to have a strategic approach to dealing with all of these units and accident emergency units as well. And I would uh, ask the Minister to reassure the House that he will look at a more strategic approach and not allow this sort of piecemeal uh, process to take place. Adam, as I said to, to the chair of the committee, some of what we're doing is counter-strategic, and I accept that. But he needs to understand the situation we're in. 63% of our, my entire budget is used to pay staff wages, salaries, national insurance and pensions. And there's no way I can touch that and make any savings, because it's three years before any redundancy saves a single penny. Another 12% of the budget is tied up in contracts. And we can't simply turn around to the contractor, say, at the new Oma Hospital, and say, sorry, folks, we've run out of money. You're going to have to stop work. That can't be done. Legally, we have to sustain that contract and any others. So therefore, the actual proportion of my budget that I can touch is 25%, roughly. Therefore, I'm inflicting an awful lot of pain on a very small part of the budget. But it's that part of the budget that can be touched legally. So therefore, I, if you're starting with a white sheet of paper with two years' notice saying, would you make the decisions you're making at the moment? And the answer is, in many cases, no, you wouldn't. But we simply have got no option but to balance the books at the end of March 2015. There is no provision to carry over a debt. It simply will not be allowed. So that is where the trusts are. They're trying to find not sometimes which are the most logical decisions, but the most deliverable decisions, and therefore that affects his constituents. And do, do I wish I wasn't in this position? I certainly would have had a lot fewer sleepless nights over this last 54 days if I hadn't to make these decisions in conjunction with the Trust. I call Michael McGimsey. Thank you, uh, Deputy uh, Speaker. And can just following on from that question, and 
We are both aware that reducing cash outlays is extremely constrained and requires a reduction in services purchased, uh, not least domiciliary care packages. Uh, can we be assured that domiciliary care packages will be maintained and particularly new admissions to independent uh, sector residential and nursing homes? The, some of the trusts as part of their contingency savings have outlined that in the last few months they're going to have to slow down the increase in packages uh, giving, given to the needy. But still, those who are in urgent need will get a domiciliary package. That will happen. Others, there will be a slight slowing down. But remember, that's in the face of an increase in resources given to that particular sector and a 5% real increase over this last year and a commitment to provide extra money under TYC for this. But I have absolutely no doubt that individual MLAs in this Assembly will be writing to me complaining that things will not move as fast as they'd wish to do so over the next four months. But again, what I'm saying is these are a needs must decision to balance the books. Because we've all heard from the chair of the committee, her view, when the department last year overspent by 0.3%, £13 million on a £5 billion budget. So that's the pain uh, that we're suffering if we go slightly over budget. So therefore, I cannot possibly consider a £70 million overspend because the criticism would be legion from members of this House. So therefore, we have to live within budget. And unfortunately, a lot of the next four months is firefighting trying to do that, rather than concentrating on what I would like to do, which is the long-term st strategic planning of what is best for health care in Northern Ireland. I wish I had time to do that, but really, it's a needs-must situation that I'm in. Call Michael McJimson for a supplementary. Uh, Deputy Speaker, and I thank the Minister for that answer. He will be aware that the concern is that elderly and vulnerable will not be receiving the services they require, therefore putting them at unmanageable and unacceptable risks. Uh, can he assure us that that will not happen? The, the Trust Chief Executives have given me a commitment that the decisions that they are taking, whilst they are painful, will not endanger long-term sustainable high-quality care. Now, the difficulty I have with this is that these are some of the finest managers in anywhere in the United Kingdom, some of whom have excellent records, even within a UK context. We appoint them, we trust them with that uh, task of coming up with the least worst options. It's therefore very difficult for me, having only been positioned back for 54 days, though can I tell you it feels like 54 years, but having only been in position for 54 days, to look over their shoulder and say that I know better or I know better because some MLA has told me he knows better or she knows better. We have to trust them to make clinical judgments on what best is best for their areas. And he, when he was a minister, was often uh, in that situation as well, where he had to trust his officials. I trust my officials. I think they're doing an excellent job in terribly difficult circumstances. But I could just say this. Over the last five years, I have had lunch or dinner or various meetings with the chief executives of the finance officers of every trust in Northern Ireland in numerous, on numerous occasions. For the first three years, they told me whilst the budget was stretching, it was deliverable, and they were going to do it with relative ease. Now they're telling me it's almost impossible. Exactly the same people serving the same communities are now telling me we're in a very different situation due to demand. Do I believe them? Yes, I do. I call Colin Eastwood. Thank you, Mr. Deputy uh, Speaker, and can I thank the Minister for his answers thus far. Uh, we all understand that we're in straitened uh, economic times and very difficult budgetary uh, times and decisions have to be made. Given the fact that we have two uh, health services on this very small island, can the Minister tell us what efficiencies are, is he trying to find by having far more, far greater cooperation on an all-island basis? I actually met my counterpart from the Republic of Ireland uh, last Wednesday in Armagh and we had a very good discussion on the very issue he raises. And one of them involved the calf labs up in Londonderry in his own constituency, where there's a proposal that those who have major cardiac events in Donegal can use the spare capacity in Elton McGelvin. 27% uh, of the renal unit patients in Daisy Hill Hospital are from Louth and North Monaghan. We have also had the decision on paediatric congenital heart disease and interventions being moved down to our ladies in Crumlin. I believe there are, there are areas where we can cooperate. But unfortunately, if anyone thinks that any of this is going to lead to the fundamental structural problem that we have with health service budgets in Northern Ireland, I'm afraid they're, they're totally wrong. Basically, we carry £160 million worth of unmet need into next year, 
and none of those proposals are going to come anywhere near funding that gap. Call me, Swid, for a brief supplementary. Oh, okay, uh, Mr. Deputy Speaker, thank the Minister for his answer. Can I just ask him around telemedicine? Has there been much work done around that to try and improve efficiencies and cooperation across the island? Indeed, three years ago, the Southern Health Trust won the award for the best telemedicine service in the United Kingdom. And the then Minister, Mr. Putz, and myself held a function up in Stormont here to congratulate them. And there wasn't the slightest interest amongst the media about that good news. Already in Northern Ireland, we are UK and British Isles leaders in this field, and there is a huge degree of potential in using telemedicine to make our services more efficient and more responsive to the needs of the patients. But again, that's a long-term process. My difficulty is none of this will help me balance the books by the 31st of March 2015, but maybe there are members here who know better than I and will help me do that. And that is the end of questions to the Minister of Health, Social Services and Public Safety. And we now move on to questions to the Minister of Justice. And I call